Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and today we have a very special guest. Lieutenant Robert Pelton is uh, currently the manage management support supervisor for the City of Altamont Springs Police Department, a wonderful graduate from our own University of Central Florida, uh, studied political science and legal studies, all that wonderful smart stuff. Absolutely. And um, I'm so glad you're here with us today, Lieutenant Pelton. Thank you for having me. Um, I know that uh, we are going to talk about a couple topics that we hear a bit about in the news and um, you know as as uh, time goes on we they become more prevalent and there's things we can do to measures we can take to help minimize or prevent them and i wanted to start today um, about a topic workplace violence um, i know we hear more and more often the term workplace violence used in uh, you know today's society and on the news but from your vantage point can you give us a definition of, of what work place violence is. Absolutely. You know, I think workplace viol violence has been coined a phrase here recently, more recently than not, with uh, some of the tragedies we've, we've seen here in the Central Florida area, but even across the country, uh, whether it be an employee walking in and, and shooting, having mass casualties, or just walking in and having a conflict between two employees. So workplace violence, I think, encapsulates all that. But what I'd like to talk about is workplace violence and what we like to say is see something, say something. Oh, that's great. Us in law enforcement, we have the term see something, do something. But what we want to empower is our employees and our employers to see something, say something. And how that can be accomplished is by empowering your employees with knowledge. And a lot of times, you know, there's statistics out there right now and we hear about these lone gunmen that walk into an establishment and start shooting the place up. However, it, it occurs or originates a lot of times from domestic violence situations. So, you know, there could be an employee that's having a problem with their spouse. Um, maybe the police have been called to the residence, or maybe there could be an injunction against that, that spouse. And, but the employees who work with her or him do not know that. So I think it's incumbent upon our employers, you know, not to share everything with the, the coworkers, but just to say, hey, you know, John's having a problem right. w with his spouse. And if they were to show up, at the at the employment please let us know and what happens is a lot of times when we respond to these incidents tragedies afterwards we talk to the victims we talk to the witnesses and they said you know what we kind of suspected something was going on we suspected there was issues um, even when he came into the lobby and he was just kind of pacing back and forth we thought something might be right but nobody said something right they all saw it but they didn't say right. anything and that's our message. If you see something, say something. But we have to arm our employees with that base knowledge so if somebody does come in, they have a little bit of background and they can take action. Do you think, I'm just thinking from a, a workplace environment myself, and, and, and if anybody's worked together uh, long enough, they kind of become this wonderful, dysfunctional little family of their own. Um, in my head as you're talking, I'm thinking a lot of times your fellow employees um, are, are very aware, more so probably than the employers, of situations and circumstances that are going on because you tend to become like family and share one another's issues. Um, it would work both ways then, kind of, wouldn't it? Absolutely. You know, if one of your coworkers is going through something, you don't have to share his or her intimate details. Right. But go to, the, go to that supervisor and just make them aware of what's going on because they're the ones who can affect change within the organization. Right. You as an individual might not be able to, but if you take it to your supervisor and they take it to their supervisor, you can affect change within the organization. And uh, something else interesting is, is that probably 90% of these incidents that occur within the uh, workplace violence it's domestic violence related. Mm. So there's one time a day that the spouse will know. You know, there's injunctions put in place. There's um, different safe houses where they can stay. So they're protected. There's a lot of things our state does and our judicial system does to protect these victims of domestic violence. But the one thing that they really cannot protect is the fact that they have a job to go to. Right. And that spouse intimately knows them more times than not. And they know that one time a day where they'll definitely show up. And that's work. They'll report to work so they know that they can find them there. So when we circle back around and we talk about workplace violence, that's why it's occurring so much is because that's the one time a day that that spouse can locate them and confront them. That's a, a very good point. And I think too, what you're saying about whether it's employer to employee or vice versa, it doesn't have to be intimate details or facts. It's just, you know, so-and-so is 
going through a very difficult time, you know, and, you know, keep an eye on them or, you know, keep your ear low to the ground and let us know. In the end, it's for that person's uh, best interest anyway. I know some people have a hard time thinking, well, I'm, you know, I'm betraying their confidence. Or, but in the end, it, it could mean their life. Absolutely. Not only their life, but their coworkers. Right. So anybody who's there to help them, I, I think when you work so closely, like you mentioned earlier, when you work so closely with somebody, right. you actually become a family at work, right. too. So you care about those people that you work with, and you want to make sure they all stay safe. Yeah, so absolutely. I think, again, to circle back around, that message is, is arming them with you know, the information they need to keep themselves safe and be aware right. and to see something, say something. Absolutely. See something, say something. Um, I know we've talked to, uh, just a touched on a couple examples of what would be considered workplace violence, but um, you know it goes a little bit beyond that sometimes. Employer directed, you know, domestic directed. We talked a little bit about. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the on the different types of what would fall under the category of workplace violence? Sure. Workplace violence, you know, like we said, it's a term that encapsulates a lot. But workplace violence could just be a dispute between to employers right. or to employees. You know, if they're out on the job site and there's a disagreement or, you know, a verbal exchange or an argument is had, that could be workplace violence, especially if it's something that continues on. The separate episode where two employees have a snippet at each other over the copy or a fax machine, right. no, we're, we're definitely not going to call that workplace violence. But this is something that escalates, it continues on, and ultimately it affects somebody either physically or, or emotionally. So it's something that I think we all need to pay close attention to and strive to make sure it doesn't happen in our own workplaces. And, uh, and employers have a, a responsibility, you know, uh, employees come to work, they do a job, they receive a wage. But employers have a responsibility to make sure that environment is, is safe from a working condition, but also safe in general from outside disturbances. And um, do you find that more employers or are there programs put in place that employers can uh, learn how to have a, a, a better work and a safer work environment for their employees? Well, you know, we're told all the time that, you know, human resources, and especially at a lot of the larger corporations, they do have that. They also have outlets that the employees, there's employee organizations, um, the EOCs, they can reach out. Employees can actually reach out um, and ask for help if they're going through something at home and, and they need counseling, um, whether it be financial counseling or whether it be grief counseling. You know, it's a wide spectrum of things that a lot of employers offer to their employees because, let's face it, a healthy employee is a well-sound right. employee and they're well productive. Right, exactly. Well, if an employer is having uh, some type of a disturbance in the workplace with a couple employees or an outside force coming in with one of their employees, um, specifically, let's say, a disgruntled employee, how is the best way an employer can not only handle the situation but without causing uh, widespread panic, you know, uh, express or relay as little information to keep the rest of their employees safe as possible. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question because I think this is what we probably see day in and day out and law enforcement responds to more often than you would think, whether it's an employee that was upset and got into it with their supervisor or it's an employee that's being terminated. Uh, these type things happen in the, in the work field every day and law enforcement is called sometimes to do what we call a standby. Uh, what I would like to suggest to the employer is if, if you see something like that happening, step in immediately. Don't let it escalate but also try to isolate it from the large group of people. Now don't go at it alone, ask for assistance, maybe a fellow supervisor or another employee, and the three of you go someplace away from the majority of the, of the individuals and you try to de-escalate the situation. But sometimes you as an employer cannot de-escalate that situation and that's where I would suggest to call your local law enforcement. We're there 24-7 to help out and we would like to respond to help de-escalate a situation than actually show up in something physical already occurring. And uh, we do that every day. And like I said, it's called a standby. You can call your local non-emergency number and just say, hey, you know, we're in the process of uh, terminating an employee or, hey, we have an employee who seems to be quite upset. I would like to engage them in conversation, but I fear that some type of physical altercation may occur. We'll come and we'll do a standby and we'll stay there quietly and keep the peace. All right. That, I actually, and that's called a standby. Absolutely. And that's a non-emergency number you would phone and just express some type of concern. Absolutely. And just explain the more information we have and we're armed with 
prior to responding, right. a lot easier for us to get there and actually deal with the situation. So make sure you give a, give that dispatcher a rundown of what exactly is occurring. Details, yeah. And we can get there and help out. Absolutely, that's wonderful. You know, based on your experience, uh, a lot of it probably being in hindsight, you know, after the situations and dealing with so many different circumstances, what do you feel based on that experience is the most effective way of dealing with these types of situations? I mean, I know that's a loaded question. They're, everyone is unique and varied, but is there a consensus of, you know, doing this and this really, really in the end is going to see a better result than if you don't? Well, you know, ultimately I, I have gone to many of these calls before and sometimes what it takes is that third party, that, that, um, person who sits by and, and listens to both sides, you know, sometimes the supervisor or the employer and the employee is separated and we're the go-between and we explain what's going on and sometimes they're not willing to accept it. However, at the end, both parties are separated and nothing transpired that would be harmful. Right. So sometimes you just need that mediator who isn't representing the corporation that this person is now being disciplined from or being let go from and uh, just talking a sense of, you know, ability to say, hey, listen, this is what's happening, this is the way it's going to go, and um, let's respect that. Absolutely. And do you think sometimes just the presence <clears throat> of, a, of a, another form of authority, you know, even though it be removed, you know, you see a law officer and, you know, that represents some type of an authority to you, sometimes people think that would aggravate the situation, but I'm thinking in the end when all is said and done, that's actually a benefit to maybe to keep a cap on things. A am I seeing that correctly? Absolutely. You're, you're spot on. Uh, a lot of times when law enforcement shows up, somebody who normally wouldn't act out or, or do anything but has that inclination of possibly escalating a situation, it's immediately squashed. Law enforcement gives that presence of uh, security, but also it keeps, keeps the peace, and that's what we're there for. Absolutely. And so if you had just one or two points of advice, just to kind of recap the, you know, the segment talking about workplace uh, violence uh, advice for an employee or another employee, what would those couple key points be to remember to have in the back of their mind? Well, the first thing is I'd speak to the employers. Make sure you arm your employees with information. If you know something that could possibly be a threat to your organization, whether it be an outside dissatisfied customer or perhaps you know that one of your employees is having some type of domestic issues with their, with their spouse. Arm, that arm your employees with that information because now if they see that threat coming onto the business property, they are able to act. And that second thing, I know we talked about it a lot, right. but see something, say something. Right. And that's what I challenge all the employees to do. If you see something that doesn't look right, say something and then make it come upon law enforcement to what we say, see something, do something. Do something, right. Let us protect you. Absolutely. Well, Lieutenant Pelton, um, what a wonderful topic and unfortunately so prevalent in today's society and, um, you know, people not really knowing how to uh, manage or, or deal with an outlet for their feelings or their emotions. Um, we thank you and, and your whole team for being available on what we call those standbys. And, and again, Absolutely. I'm going to say, say, see something, say something for the general public. Absolutely. And then you guys will come in and see something and do something. Yes, sir. And I appreciate it. I'm, I'm going to ask you guys just to stay right where you are right now. We're going to be right back after this short break. It's a beautiful day out here, sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 90 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Come on, that's it, let's go. Welcome back to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and as promised, we've kept Lieutenant Robert Pelton with the uh, Altamont Springs Police Department here with us. And uh, thank you again, Lieutenant Pelton, for being with us. I know that first segment we talked about, very interesting and unfortunately very relevant in today's society about workplace violence. And I kind of want to talk on another topic that, you know, isn't new. Um, I don't know what the phrase I want to use is, not gained popularity, but became more, um, more well known, you know, a decade or two ago, which is road rage. And essentially all we're talking about today is just really a lack of 
the ability to properly, I think, um, process our emotions and our feelings in a healthy manner, both for ourselves and for those around us. And, and so I want to kind of talk about road rage and get your definition on what that is from a law uh, you know, enforcement perspective is and, and why does it continue to be so prevalent? Absolutely. Well, of course, road rage is nothing new to us. Um, we hear the term used quite a bit. Right. And um, unfortunately, there's some tragedies that have resulted from road rage, um, shootings or crashes um, that we just we don't want to see out there on the roadways. Right. And I think what it stems from is it stems from a um, driver who loses control of their, of their physical or mental being while on the road. Something uh, enrages them, whether it's traffic, maybe they just had an argument with their spouse mm -hmm. at home, and now they've put themselves behind the wheel, or, or they're late, and then they feel like people are preventing them from getting to where they're getting to. And what we want to say is, take a deep breath, you know, help prevent road rage by leaving, leaving your house on time to get to work. If you are running behind, um, don't drive aggressive. And I think aggressive driving and road rage kind of rolls into one. Right. Because that person who's having road rage is the aggressive driver nine times out of ten. And uh, not only are you putting your life in danger, but you're putting everybody around you in danger right. as well. And, um, you know, for those who experience road rage, uh, what you can do to stop somebody from having road rage sometimes is to disengage. Don't feed the fire. Right. You know, if they're sitting there with the hand gestures or screaming or honking, uh, ignore them. There's no reason to indulge them and do anything that would further infuriate them. And, you know, in society today, sadly enough, there's uh, people who are willing to pull weapons. We mm. get those 911 calls that somebody was honking and, you know, using obscene gestures, and the next thing you know, a weapon was displayed. Mm. Well, that's just escalated the situation right. to a point of, of, of no turn back. For that person who did it, they're committing a crime. And for that victim, for them, that's something they're never going to forget. Right. And they tell us quite often, man, I felt my life flash before me over somebody cutting me off. Right. So take your time. Take a deep breath. If you are a victim of road rage, make sure you call. Call the police immediately, but disengage. And what I mean by disengage is slow down, put some distance between you and that aggressor, whether, it, even if you have to get off, if you're on the interstate and you have to take that next exit to separate, do that because now we're talking about your safety. But if you can, just back off, put some car lengths behind you, but make that phone call. Here in the state of Florida, Highway Patrol is something very easy to remember, Star FHP. Star FHP goes directly to the Florida Highway Patrol. That's their dispatch. Give them that mile marker. Give them that rest stop you just passed. Right. And then the best thing you can do is become the best witness possible. Tell them what the suspect looked like. Tell them the vehicle. If you get a tag, great. But again, don't re-engage re that vehicle to go grab that just tag. For that, yeah. It's your safety that we're most concerned with. And do we have any statistics? I mean, I'm sure there's national statistics and local statistics, but here for Central Florida, are there any statistics that would be important for our viewers to be aware of? Well, I would like to think based on our municipality and what we've experienced that road rage is declining. However, we still receive phone calls for it um, quite often, perhaps maybe not as much as we used to, but it's still very prevalent. And I, I hope that the public message that gets out there is, is that disengage. Right. You know, if you're a victim of it, don't escalate the situation by this person just said something to me. This person keeps honking the horn, so now I'm going to honk the horn at them. Or if they just cut me off, now I'm going to tailgate right. them. Don't do that. Be a solution to the problem. Don't, don't, add to this. don't add to that problem. And do you find, too, as you're talking to me, I'm thinking, you know, we always talk about, you know, driving under the influence. And, of course, that's attributed to, you know, alcohol or chemical, you know, um, drugs in the system and stuff. But this, in some ways, um, more be it with emotions and, and lack of control is very similar in the fact that it can do damage to not just yourself but to everyone around you. Absolutely. So, you know, if you are that person who is, is prone to road rage, you know, you put yourself behind the wheel of a car when you're upset, um, your emotions have a way of creating a lot of, a, a lot of issues on the roadway and you're affecting everybody around you. And what are some of the common signs of, of, of road rage? I mean, there must be things, steps that we see before it escalates into full-blown. Sure. Well, you know, obviously we see the person who's 
kind of easing over on you. They have their turn signal on and, you know, maybe, or you have your turn signal on and that person just keeps creeping up to close that right. gap, not to allow you to merge over. They call it a merge lane for a reason, to keep the flow of traffic going. Right. You're supposed to be able to merge, but that person who's committing some type of road rage is preventing you from merging, and uh, that's the first sign. You know, a little bit of aggressive driving. We talked about it earlier, the aggressive driving, it mixes in with road rage. So now, you know, perhaps <coughs> maybe what you should do is just stop, keep your turn signal on, and merge at that next person right. who's going to allow you to merge. But if you add to the problem, you keep merging over onto them, now you have the battle of the wills, and it turns into full-blown right. road rage. Um, some of your other common signs, obviously, the improper use of horn. Believe it or not, in the state of Florida, there is a citation that can be issued for oh, wow. excessive or improper use of horn. Um, the people who just keep laying on the horn, whether they're honking at you. I, I've seen it in traffic. Um, sometimes I drive an unmarked police car, and that person thinks I should have pulled out, so they lay on the horn and keep on honking. So nobody's immune from road rage. Right. And uh, there's all different. We could sit here all day and talk about right. different things uh, people do, scream out the window, you know, the obscene hand gestures. But uh, for our viewers, what we want them to know is disengage from that aggressive driver, from that person committing road rage. It's not worth your safety, your passenger safety, or anybody else on the roadway around you. Absolutely. And I know um, <clears throat> you've just given us some points on, you know, wh what are some common steps we can do to make sure that a, a serious accident doesn't happen. Um, disengage, of course, sounds like it, it would be the best uh, remedy to immediately diffusing the situation. What, what if you're in those instances where <clears throat> disengaging um, actually fuels that person, you know, like you're, you're not, I'm trying to think from a psychological standpoint. Sure. You know, you're, you're not paying them the attention they want. You're not uh, respecting the fact that they have an issue with you. You know, what are some additional steps beyond that? Uh, you know, do you ever want to pull off the road? If you do, should it be where there are a lot of other people? I mean, I know this is highlighting a specific, you know, setup. Um, Absolutely. But, but w what are your thoughts on that? All valid points. And like we said earlier, you know, I don't know very many citizens today that don't carry their cell phone with them. Right. So you may have to resort to calling law enforcement. And we mentioned it earlier, yes. if, you're on our, if you're in the state of Florida and you're on our highway, STAR FHP, FHP is right. the easiest way to get a hold of law enforcement. So pick up your cell phone in a safe manner and call for help. But never get out of the vehicle. Your vehicle can be used as a safe place for you. Put up the windows, lock the doors, and don't engage them. And you know, if they do get fueled by the fact that you're ignoring them, right. well, I, I don't know very many people that when they're ignored, they get as escalated as if you engage them and you give them a reason to be upset. So if you can't just pull off the side of the road and someone's help, continue driving. Drive to a populated area. I'll tell you right now, uh, criminals, they don't like witnesses. Right. So if you pull into that large populated area, they're less likely to create a criminal act or have a criminal act occur against you right. where there's a lot of witnesses. And then if you're familiar with the area and you know where your local police department is or even fire station, pull into that public facility and they're probably not going to follow you there. Absolutely. And what, you know, we know with DUI, there's, you know, the, the, the punishment procedure and stuff. Uh, what is in place currently as it pertains to road rage? I mean, citation wise and and how many before, is there a number before there's a risk of losing your license? I'm just out of curiosity, how has this evolved as this has become a more um, reoccurring or prominent problem? Well, road rage is something that we've titled it. Uh, what it actually is is aggressive driving. Okay. And aggressive driving is a form of a citation, and it's an escalated form of citation. You have careless driving. Careless driving can be issued to somebody who perhaps uh, rear ends somebody, and it's the catch-all for why a crash occurs. Okay. But then you have aggressive driving, and aggressive driving um, is something that we could escalate to criminal. And uh, what the aggressive driving does is if they put anybody else in harm's way. So speeding a lot of times could be considered aggressive driving if they're over a certain mile per hour where a posted speed is and they have a passenger. They've now put that passenger in harm's way, and if we can articulate that, that could turn criminal. Okay. And um, is there any... Um any type of courses, uh, you know, that people that have a history of this, um, you know, are required to take. Um, I would imagine there are. Um, Absolutely. To, to learn how to process not only their emotion, but realize the capacity of safety 
in a ripple effect when you're on the roadways. Absolutely, and it's interesting that you say that because we're in traffic court quite a bit and uh, something that the judges have at their disposal is is ordering those people not only to pay a fine but also to attend Excellent. driver improvement courses. And there actually is a 40-hour aggressive driving course. So for those people who have been caught committing the act of road rage, speeding, improper lane changes, being aggressive on our roadways, we issue those citations. And some of their punishment isn't only just to pay the citations, but then those judges order them to attend an aggressive driving course. And most of those aggressive driving courses are anywhere from 32 up to 80 hours. Wow. So it just depends on how many times they've been actually caught and cited for doing so. Out of curiosity, and I mean nothing by this question, statistically, uh, people that uh, have an issue with road rage, road rage um, statistically, is there a vast difference between men versus women? You know, I, could, I wish I could put numbers towards you as yes. far as what it is, but I have to say I think we see the males with a lot more okay. aggressive driving. And, you know, that goes, back to, that goes back to our crashes as well. You know, we talk about insurance rates. Right. Uh, historically, males um, of a younger age, from 16 right. to 24, their insurance is probably the most uh, out of anybody right. group of insured. Because why that is, is because you see the most severe crashes. And where those most severe crashes come from, it comes from speed. So the property damage is, is valued a lot higher. So, you know, if we looked at statistics, um, personally speaking, we see males engaged mm -hmm. in a lot more road rage than females. But uh, females aren't immune to it. Right. We see fem females committing road rage too. But uh, if you if you ask me on a personal level, because I don't have the statistics no, for you, no. uh, we see males engage in a lot more road rage than females. I would have been my, my guess if mm -hmm. I had to make one. And the other question I have too is typically with someone with road rage, I know you're not a psychologist or anything, but um, this isn't usually just something that pops up. I mean, usually there are other similar, uh, similarly related um, things going on in that person's life where maybe things are out of control or they have problems in general processing emotion or circumstance. Am I too far off on that? No, not at all, because we respond to those calls and we do find the people committing the road rage. You know, they've given us a tag number, they've given us a vehicle description, and we catch up to those vehicles and we conduct a traffic stop and we do our investigation. And in talking to these people, they have two common themes. The first one is that other driver wronged them. They did something to them. Right. Um, they feel they were so wrong. Right. They they were cut off. They weren't let into a lane. Something immediately happened that committed the uh, act of turning them into that right. hostile person. The second thing is uh, they concede to it. They say, you know what, officer, I'm so sorry. I'm having a bad day at right. work. Uh, my wife and I just got into a fight. Yes. They got into that car angry, and now something right. so minor has set them off. Absolutely. So I think those are the two things that you know we come across a lot in how that road rage Absolutely. was created originally. Well, Lieutenant, thank you so much for being here with us today. You've been a great uh, source of information for us and viewers. I hope that you've learned a little bit something today. And remember, if we all calm down, take our time, whether at work or in the car, uh, we can all spread a little bit of joy in our town. We'll see you again real soon. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.